Good morning, everyone. I'm Seth Statler. I have the uh, great honor and privilege of serving as NASA's Associate Administrator for Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs. And it is such a great honor for me to welcome all of you, the U United States Youth Program <coughs> delegates for 2014 here to NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are very honored and, and uh, happy to be able to share the exciting NASA story with such an exceptional group of students. We'll be joined by my boss, Administrator Charles Bolden, in just a few minutes. But, uh, and, and then we will have the amazing opportunity to talk directly to astronauts Richard Mastracchio and Koshi Wakata, traveling at 17,000 plus miles per hour, far above us, uh, up in the sky. But right now, to introduce Administrator Bolden, I'm very uh, pleased to bring to the stage the uh, Senate Youth Program Delegate from South Carolina, Brandon Muniz. Good morning. Space, the final frontier, the great unknown. So vast, we were only beginning to understand the things that we didn't know about it. Just as many of us have at one point been scared of what was under the bed, space can be dark and frightening. To lead the explorations, a person need not only courage and dedication, but also sacrifice. These traits have certainly been found in Administrator Bolden. He has not only led NASA on the ground as NASA Administrator, but has also commanded two of his four missions to space. He is a devoted public servant who can serve as a role model for those wanting to give to this country. I had the privilege of listening to him speak at Palmetto Boys State in June. He spoke not only about NASA's past, but also its future. I know he will be just as thought-provoking today. So now, with great honor and pride, I welcome my fellow South Carolinian, Administrator Charles Bolden, to the stage. Thanks very much, Brandon. Thank you. Uh, let me thank Brandon very much. Um, the television audience, you didn't have an opportunity, unfortunately, to listen to Dr. Thaler. I want to thank Michelle Thaler for an incredible presentation that she did to this group just before we went on the air. Um, Brandon and I are both from South Carolina, as he said, as, as a couple of the other delegates here. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to NASA headquarters also. You know, when Michelle started, she said they, they gave her 40, 15 minutes to talk about the universe. They gave me a lot of paper. And um, some of the sponsors back there know that I generally don't use the paper, and I don't intend to do so today. I'll use it for notes and stuff. Let me thank the, uh, the military reps who are here that, are, that have been mentors for the group. Uh, thank you for your service, uh, but also for taking the time to be with this incredible group of young men and women. And hopefully, uh, someday when they decide what they want to do when they grow up, they'll say they want to be like some of you. That's how I happen to end up where I am now. Uh, I, I graduated from C.A. Johnson High School in Columbia, South Carolina, not far from Aiken and not far from Myrtle Beach. And uh, I never dreamed of doing anything that I've done in my adult life. So let me start out with that. Uh, one of the things I would tell you is that um, whatever you do, you need to be passionate um, about that. Everybody has something, and you don't have to write notes here. I see everybody head down writing notes. There will not be a test. I can promise you that. But um, all of you are way ahead of where I was when I was your age. You know, I, a lot of you already know what you want to do. Some of you want to be senators and congressmen, and several of you want to be president. Um, hopefully, some of you want to want to serve in the military. Hopefully, uh, that will come. Uh, when I was your age, a little bit before this time, when I was in seventh grade, for me, I decided I wanted to go to the United States Naval Academy. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't know anything else. I had seen a program on television called Men of Annapolis. I fell in love with the campus, never having seen it. Uh, fell in love with the uniform, really. Uh, but then, truth be told, young men, uh, I really liked the fact that on the weekends, the campus was just full of girls. And, uh, and the girls loved the, you know, the choker, the white choker uniform and all that stuff. So that's what I wanted to do as a seventh grader. And I really, I tried from that day all the way to my senior year in high school to get into the Naval Academy. And every year I would apply, I'd be told my, by my congressmen, my senators, and even the vice president, okay, you're a little early. Wait until you're a senior and then 
you know, write me back again. And, and every year I would say, thanks very much, but I just want you to know who I am. Because when it's time for me to apply, I, I don't want you to have to wonder whether or not, you know, this guy Charlie Bolden, Charles Bolden back then, I was Charles Jr., little Charles, uh, to my family. I'm still little Charles. Uh, but, but I said, I don't want you to make any mistake. I'm serious about this. This is really what I want to do. I was passionate about going to the Naval Academy. And um, many, many years later, uh, in spite of all the obstacles I had, having growing up in, in the segregated South, it was a little bit difficult back then to get into the Naval Academy. But, but anyway, I got in. And uh, first thing that happened, my plebe summer, uh, I hated it. I mean, I had, this, was my, this was what I had wanted to do all of my childhood. And uh, I got there and I hated it. It was hard. Uh, people didn't want me to be there. You were running all the time. You know, it was just back then, they didn't beat on you, but they may as well have. That's what it felt like. And so I would call home, and I'd tell my mom and dad, I want to come home. And they would say, but you wanted to be there so bad. I said, I know that, but this place is hard. And my father, who was my high school football coach, my mother had been my junior high school librarian. I was a library assistant. My dad would say, look, uh, hang in there one more week. And I said, I don't want to. He said, just trust me. Hang in there one more week. 52 weeks, my dad would tell me that. Hang in there one more week. And so for 52 weeks, I hung in there one more week, and I made it through plebe year. And then after that, it didn't get much better. Uh, I never loved it, uh, but I began to understand what it was I was going through. And, uh, and my passion for being there and getting a commission in the military finally returned, and I, ma and my, I made it through. Two things I knew when I left C.A. Johnson. One was I was never going to go into the Marine Corps. Marines were crazy. Uh, so that was one thing I knew. I just knew it was going to be something in the Navy. I knew I wasn't going to fly airplanes because flying was inherently dangerous and I had no real interest in doing that either. Uh, so those were the two things I knew when I came out of high school. No Marine Corps, no flying. Uh, my very first year when the academic year started, my first company officer was a young Marine Corps major by the name of John Riley Love who was awesome. Uh, he was very much like my dad, incredibly tough, but eminently fair. And I watched him, and I watched his style of leadership, and, and he left at the end of that year, and so didn't really think about him very much until my senior year, and, and I had to make a decision of what I wanted to do. And I had been on ships, I had played Marine, I had done everything, and I knew I could, I could be successful at anything I chose because that's the way my mom and dad had raised me. But I took a look back and I said, you know what, I want to be like him. And so I went into the Marine Corps. That's how I did it. Uh, I wanted to be an infantry officer because he was an infantry officer. And I went down to Quantico, Virginia and went through a six-month course that every Marine officer has to do called the basic school. And uh, I was down there and the weather was horrible. Uh, it was the fall uh, of 1968 and it snowed and it iced and it did everything. And we went out for a final exercise called the three-day war. I don't know whether we do the, do we still do the three-day war? Okay, all right. I almost froze to death. I did not sleep for three days. I volunteered for every fire watch because I knew if I put my head down, I was going to die. Uh, so I made, made it through the three-day war, and I came back. And um, I had married after graduating from, from the Naval Academy. And I went back, and I told my wife, I said, you know, um, I don't think I want to be an infantry officer. So you got some infantry officers back here, I think. But I said, that's not for me. I don't want to crawl around in the mud, but I don't want to go to flight school. And my wife kept saying, but we can go to Pensacola, and you can do it. And as has been the case for 45 years plus of my marriage, uh, I finally found out that my wife was right. You know, we were going to Pensacola and things would work out. So I said, okay, let's go to Pensacola, Florida. We did. First time I got in an airplane, I fell in love with it. And I could not believe I had not wanted to do that. And then after that, things started happening. Uh, I had a test pilot who was an instructor of mine. We talked about what it was like. So my next goal was to become a test pilot. Took Many, many, many applications to do that, but finally I got to be a test pilot. And while I was a test pilot, I met somebody called, a, a, a young man by the name of Dr. Ron McNair, the late, great Dr. Ron McNair. Uh, Ron was from a place called Lake City, South Carolina, not very far from where I had grown up. Uh, Lake City is really small, too. But Ron, like me, was an African-American. Ron was in the first group of space shuttle astronauts selected by NASA. Uh, he had been selected in 1978, and so he was going through his initial training when he came to visit Pax River with some of the test pilot graduates who had come back for a reunion. We talked about what it was like to be in the astronaut program. And before Ron left on Sunday, he, he kind of looked at me because he knew I'd become excited about what he was talking about. He said, hey, 
are you going to apply for the program? I said, not on your life. And Ron said, why not? I said, they'd never pick me, uh, which my mother and father would have just been embarrassed if they had heard me say that. But I said, they'd never pick me. And Ron looked at me just like I'm looking at you. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. He said, how do you know? How do you know that they won't pick you if you don't apply? And so what I did after that was I got embarrassed because, like I said, my mom and dad would have been really disappointed that I thought there was something I couldn't do. And I applied. I ended up getting an opportunity to interview and then selected in the second group of space shuttle astronauts. So I went to Houston in 1980 with my wife and my son and daughter, and we started what became a 14-year career in the astronaut program. So I say that to say, you know, if you're passionate about what you want to do, no matter what it is, uh, you can do it if you stick to it. If you study really hard, work hard, and just stay as dedicated to it as you are to the, being in this program. You know, you didn't have to do this program. Uh, somebody gave you the opportunity and they probably said, you know, you're going to go to D.C. Some of you may have just wanted to come to D.C. I don't know. But you're here and I think you're passionate about this. And so that's, that's really what you have to do. You have to be very passionate about whatever you do and, and it will serve you very well. Here at NASA, we're really passionate about the things we do. Uh, I like to tell people all the time, you know, we're in the future business. Uh, right now, we have done a number of things in the period of time that I've been the NASA administrator. We flew the space shuttle for 30 absolutely incredible years. It was an, just an amazing vehicle. And if you're fortunate enough to go out to Udvahazi, the Smithsonian annex out at Dulles Airport here, or you go down to the Kennedy Space Center and, and their visitor center, you go up to the Intrepid Museum in New York, or you go out to the California Science Center, you can actually see one of the real space shuttles that went to, went to space. Endeavor's out at California in LA. Uh, Atlantis is down at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Enterprise, which never went to space, but uh, it was the test vehicle that allowed us to actually continue to develop the space shuttle program. We wouldn't have had a program had it not been for Enterprise. And then Discovery, uh, is right here in D.C. at Udva Hazi. So I would invite you to go look at any of them. They're all in different configurations to represent some phase of the space shuttle's mission, whether it's landing up at Udva Hazi for discovery, the launch configuration that it's going to be in out in L.A. It's actually in space flying with the payload bay doors opening, open down at the Kennedy Space Center. So absolutely fantastic. This year, uh, going back to a little bit of what, what Michelle was talking about, but, but back here on that other planet that's in the solar system. You know, there, there, are, there are, I know they're not nine anymore, but I still love Pluto. Um, so there's eight and a dwarf planet. But, uh, but the third rock from the sun happens to be ours. And so this year, NASA is going to have an, we are scheduled to, to launch five uh, Earth science missions. That's unprecedented for us since decades ago. So we're going to launch, we just finished launching one, collaborating with the Japanese called uh, the Global Precipitation Monitor uh, out of Tanegashima in, J in Japan just last week. Uh, and then we have five more. Two of them will actually be flown on the International Space Station that Michelle talked about. So uh, that's what we're trying to do, trying to learn more about our own uh, our own planet, the one that, that on which we live, and the only one that we know has life right now. As Michelle alluded, there are a number of moons of planets and other planets, Mars is one of them, that we think hold the possibility that they could have had life, could sustain life now or what. And so Mars right now is our ultimate destination for, we think, for humanity, and there are a number of other nations in the world who agree with us uh, who have agreed to work on something we call the Global Exploration Roadmap. Uh, it is actually a document that you could go and Google and then you could read it. And it talks about this, this stepping stone approach that we're using to put in humans on Mars in, by the 2030s because the president has told us to do that. Uh, he has said that he wants to see, he thinks that we can have humans on an asteroid in 2020, by 2025 and humans on Mars in the 2030s. So we're working diligently to do that. We have a space technology organization, our human exploration organization, all are trying to develop the technologies that will enable us to get humans to Mars. Uh, we didn't talk about it, but they did in the video. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. They talked about what we call the asteroid redirect mission. Uh, Three-phase mission, one is to try to identify and characterize as many asteroids as we can, particularly the, the ones that are not giant, that are not uh, you know, planet destroying, but they could destroy communities if they were able to make it through the atmosphere and actually impact. A little bit more than a year ago in Chelyabinsk, Russia, 
we were reminded of what, what, uh, you know, what, what asteroids, meteorites can do if they get through the atmosphere. One exploded over that town, uh, damaged, uh, did a lot of damage, uh, hurt about 1,500 people. So we don't want to be like the dinosaurs. We really believe that there is a way for humans to intervene. Uh, so our concept is to actually find an asteroid that's on its way toward Earth. Uh, right now, we're trying to decide whether we want a big one or a little one. Uh, we, we tend to think we want one that's small enough to capture, one that may be in the, I don't know, 7 to 10 meter uh, diameter size uh, that weighs hundreds of tons. We would go and rendezvous with it and either capture it in a capture mechanism or attach ourselves to it. And then for about a year and a half, you just thrust against it. We're going to use something called solar electric propulsion. And if you can imagine a, you know, just imagine a big peach, okay? And, and that peach is coming toward your head, and you don't want it to come toward your head, there's several things you can do. You can either duck, well, Earth can't do that. Uh, or you can catch the peach or you can parry it. You know, you just kind of stick your hand up and it kind of parries off your hand. Uh, we want to do something similar to parrying the peach as it comes at your head. We want to get with that asteroid, ride along with it, but we're going to thrust against it, its, its, its direction, for about a year, year and a half, and very gradually start to move it off its course toward Earth. We really would like to get it to start moving toward the moon. If it gets close enough to the moon, it does what we do, what we did in the Apollo era. The moon's gravity takes it and draws it in. And we'd like to get it into a, a sort of a counter-rotating, a stable orbit of the moon. Once that's done, then we can launch astronauts from Earth. We can fly them to the moon because we do know how to do that. Have them rendezvous with the asteroid that's now in lunar orbit, and they can do interactions with the asteroid, take samples, bring them back to Earth, and it'll give us an opportunity to study it. We want to put it in an orbit. It'll probably stay there for 100 years. So there will be many, many, many astronauts who will have an opportunity to visit the asteroid and do work on it. Some of you in this room, actually, if you decide, as Michelle said, that you want to turn to STEM-related areas, science, technology, engineering, and math, some of you may one day be an astronaut and may be actually working on an asteroid or even going to Mars. And, and that really can happen. So uh, you, it, I would not, you know, don't, don't discount your ability to do that. Uh, I think you can. Um, again, we're really passionate about that. We believe it. Not a lot of people, uh, I think, believe that we can do that. We believe we can. Michelle talked about Curiosity landing on Mars. Uh, the Curiosity mission was kind of incredible when you think about the way that, that we did it. Uh, it's about eight months to get to Mars today with conventional propulsion. So we launched this thing called the Mars Science Laboratory on an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral uh, down in Florida. And eight months later, uh, August of, of 2012, all of a sudden, you know, it finally got to Mars. It got sucked into the Martian uh, gravitational field, and then it started plummeting toward the planet. And it, uh, we, if, some of you may have seen a movie that, we, that some of our engineers made called Seven Minutes of Terror. Uh, the seven minutes of terror comes from the fact that Mars is so far away that by conventional communications today, it takes us seven minutes to send a signal to Mars and then seven minutes to get it back. So in the time that we were sitting on the ground at the Jet Propulsion Labs, biting our fingernails, wondering what was happening to Curiosity, we knew that, uh, you know, Seven minutes ago, it either landed in one piece and it's safe, or seven minutes ago, it didn't successfully get through the atmosphere and it crashed and it's in thousands of pieces. So that's kind of where the seven minutes of terror comes from. Mars's atmosphere is not quite as thick as Earth's. It, it, what that means is it's really hard to decelerate it, to slow it down, so we had to do all that stuff. And then finally, it was lowered to the surface of Mars by a sky crane. All kinds of really fluky stuff, but it turns out that non-complicated sounding, things like that, which were very complicated to do, got curiosity on the surface of Mars. And there it's doing incredible stuff. And it's going to climb a mountain in the middle of the crater where it landed called Mount Sharp. Anybody ever been to the Grand Canyon? Anybody ever trek up the wall of the Grand Canyon? What do you notice about uh, Earth as you go up the wall of the Grand Canyon? What do you see? Strata, right? And what does each of those layers represent? Huh? Different time eras in the history of Earth. Curiosity is going to climb Mount Sharp because Mount Sharp is exactly like the wall of the Grand Canyon. It's got strata. 
And some of those, a couple of them, actually to us look like it might be something like limestone. Probably not limestone, but something that at one time may have been underwater. If it was underwater and we can get there, and Curiosity, which as Michelle said, is a big, big chemistry lab. It's just got 10 chemistry labs on it. It also has a probe, and it can drill, and can do all kinds of stuff and sample. If we find out in one of those layers that there is organic life, think what that means. Think what that means. You know, there are two questions that humans ask themselves all the time. You all probably, you're too, you know, you're too fancy to do this stuff, and you don't want to admit it. But we ask ourselves all the time. Michelle makes a living trying to figure out, how did all this stuff happen? How did, how did we get here? How did life come about? Big bang, mini big bangs, boom, like that, or whatever. Uh, and there is no difference to me between my religious beliefs and my scientific beliefs. It's all something happened in the beginning, and we don't know what that was precisely. Then the second question we ask is, are we by ourselves? You know, are we alone? Is there other life in this universe? you know, in our galaxy and some of these other gazillion galaxies that are out there. And so that's among the things that we hope to find. If Curiosity detects uh, a life form on Mars or gets, gets evidence that there was once a life form on Mars, or if a future mission to Europa finds that there is a life form or a sign of life in the deep oceans of, of the moon Europa, uh, that's a game changer uh, in, in terms of our understanding of our universe. So that's, that's really, really, really important for us. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, I talked about my, I, I didn't talk about my parents. I talked about growing up in South Carolina. But I'll tell you real quickly, my parents were educators. My mom, as I mentioned, was a librarian. She had been a librarian at the elementary level, junior high school, and then high school. And my father was a high school teacher, but he was also a football coach, my football coach. And, uh, you know, they were both um, explorers in their own right. Uh, but they didn't explore space and other kinds of stuff the way that I have been doing. Uh, they explored the mind and the intellect. And their destination wasn't another planet, as mine is. Their destination was people like you. It was young people that they wanted to enrich with a, a spirit of passion and, and a spirit of, of a will to learn. And I think they did that incredibly well. They did it for me. And so, what this program, what the Senate Youth Program is trying to do for you, and it's been doing it for 52 years, is that exact same thing. It's trying to give you, uh, you know, inst put a little fire under you, make you understand that, boy, uh, there's a lot more than you ever thought about living in Aiken or living in Myrtle Beach or living wherever you happen to be. You came from Turkey. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out here. And all you have to do is ask. Uh, study really hard to get there. But you've got to ask. And as I mentioned, you don't have any idea what you're going to be. It's good that you think you know. That's really important. It's good to have an idea. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I, I was wrong, as a matter of fact, about the things that I wasn't going to do, because I ended up doing both things that I said we weren't. We're doing some renovating here in the building right now. And before we started it, we used to have a, 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 a sign hanging out here on the wall. And it was a, a quote from Helen, Helen Keller. And, and I, I say this, and I quote, no pessimist ever discovered the secret of the stars or sailed to an, an uncharted land or opened a new doorway for the human spirit, unquote. Um, what she meant was you've got to be optimistic and positive in how you look at life. Uh, you know, it's a difficult time. Some of you hear your parents and you hear friends or everybody's kind of down every once in a while. Uh, you've got to be positive about everything. You've got to be an optimist because the world will be better. It's good now. It could be a lot worse than it is. There are people who don't live the way that we live, who don't have the opportunities that we have. So uh, I would say put a positive spin on everything. Uh, you can do it. We're in the future business, as I said. It's a really, really, really exciting time uh, for us in NASA because we're doing earth science. We're doing planetary science. We're looking at the sun. Uh, we're looking at our universe and astrophysics. In human space flight, we've got people on the International Space Station, and you're going to have an opportunity to talk to them in just a few minutes. Uh, you're going to talk to Koichi Wakata, who now uh, is the commander of the International Space Station. He became the first Japanese to command the International Space Station last week when the other half of their crew uh, came back home on a Soyuz spacecraft and landed in Kazakhstan. We've got another, uh, another partial crew, another three that are going to go up at the end of this month. So, We've been on the International Space Station now for almost 14 years. 
So uh, I know you all are a little bit more than 13, 14, but almost all of your life, there has not been one second, not one second, when a human being, uh, at least a Russian and an American, have not been on the International Space Station orbiting Earth uh, 250 miles above us. Any of you have an opportunity in your classes to talk to the station before? So this may not be new for some of you. Anybody? No? Okay. Oh, you have. What school do you go to? Oh, so this will be this won't be a new experience, but a but a later experience. So you can you have an idea. Really important to us, and the reason I asked a young woman to come up to this to the mic. It is really important to us to make sure that, that we have representation from everybody. You know, uh, diversity is big for us, diversity and inclusion. I'm looking for people who can get the job done. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what faith they are. I don't care whether they're you know, female, male, in between. I don't care. I just want them to be able to do a job. We look for people who, who can excel. And so that's really important. And hopefully, you will get that out of this program. You'll get it out of your mentors. Uh, we're looking for people who really want to perform and who are passionate about what they do. So um, we are very privileged to have, uh, we selected a, a new class of astronauts, the class of 2013, uh, just this past year. Uh, we had an unprecedented thing happen in that class. There were eight people selected out of 6,300. Four of them are women. So 50% of that class is women. That's never happened before. And, uh, and I think it's incredible. We, we, we're very proud of what we do there. So, um, um, you know, just come work with us if, if you want. Uh, the International Space Station, uh, I will say one last time, represents, a, it's a mini United Nations. It, it is a conglomeration of, there are 15 different nations who participate in it right now, five principal partners, the European Space Agency, the U.S., Japan, Russia, Canada. Uh, we kind of manage it together. In spite of all that's going on down here on the Earth, uh, we continue to do our work on the International Space Station as a good team. So uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to kind of wrap up here. And, uh, you know, I, as I said, you'll get an opportunity to talk to Michelle and me at the end of this next session. But uh, what I want to do is get you prepared. Sit back, relax. If you're napping, wake up. Um, <coughs> because I'm going to introduce you to two people, two good friends of mine. One is Rick Mastracchio. Uh, and Rick was in the, remember the video uh, when you saw the two astronauts that were talking? Uh, Rick was the one on your left who passed the mic over. Uh, Rick has now been up there for a little bit more than three months and will be there another three months. Uh, Koichi uh, is along with him, so they've been crewmates. And uh, those are the two you're going to talk to. So you'll be talking to the commander of the, the International Space Station, Koichi Wakata, Wakata-san and uh, Rick Mastracchio, and some of you, I think, who, who are the designated questioners? Do we have them? Wow, all right here. Okay, and then how are they going to do that? Are they going to pass a mic, or they're going to come up here? So are you going to tell them to do that, or should I tell them to do that when it's time? All right, one by one, two by two. Okay, the, we have to go through some formalities here about introducing me to the station, and so you'll hear us. You remember this? When they went station, this is whatever your elementary school was. That's what they did. You were, how old were you? Nine. Too young. Okay. Nine. Okie dokie. They tell me less than one minute. So you'll wait. Hurry up and wait one more time. I know you're anxious. I know. It's coming. It's coming. Your heart's pounding, huh? Don't worry about it. They're normal people. They're just like us. Just like you. da 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 I would ask if there's a question, but then everybody would panic because I can't answer a question in 30 seconds, and so they would, they would be worried. What you're going to do is they're going to hand us off to Houston, to the Mission Control Center in Houston, and now they'll tell me everything's set up. So you're probably, uh, that's James Webb. <laughs> I could sing, but you wouldn't like that, so I, I won't do that. Anyway, no, nah, that's all right. That's okay. Maybe one of you could come up and sing. You have a choir yet? Singing group? Huh? A cappella group? Is that right? Have they performed? What, you got a name? What's the name of the group? Three Amigos. Three Amigos? Can you do a quick, like a 10, do we have 10 seconds? 10 seconds worth? That's all right. Give us the first 10 seconds of a 10 minute long. 
number. What do you, what's your favorite song, favorite number? Up. Oh, okay, that's all right. Save it, save it, save it. We'll, we'll get to it. What is it? Number six. Okay, we'll get to number six. Hey, Houston, this is headquarters. You guys hear me? Nope. It's not time yet, but that's okay. They tell me to calm down, be peaceful. I have to look, okay. You've got the guy in the pink. He's the flight director, so he's in charge. That means everybody in the room does what he says do. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? That's the Capcom, capsule communicator is what we, we don't have capsules anymore, but it's, it's left over. There's Koichi in the, in the pink, is that pink? What is, what's, what's the real color? Salmon? Okay, he's in salmon. You said fuchsia? Fuchsia? You vote for fuchsia? Okay, salmon. And Rick just floated out, so they're trying to make sure they're here. If I'm not mistaken, what you're looking at in the back, it, you're looking through the hatch. Um, Trying to remember what's up there right now. You're probably looking into one of the cargo Station, vehicles. Station, this is Houston on Space to Ground 2. Are you That's ready Rick for Mastaccio the event? with his arms folded. Yay! Station, this is Houston on Space to Ground 2. Are you ready for the event? Uh-oh. <laughs> Houston Station, uh, we are ready for the event. Mr. Bolton, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. I will. Thank you very much. Station, this is Washington NASA Headquarters. How do you read? Oh. NASA Headquarters, uh, Mr. Bolton, uh, we have you loud and clear. What's this Mr. Bolden Welcome stuff? Welcome to the Space Station. What's this Mr. Bolden stuff, Koichi? How you doing? You and Rick. Good to see you guys. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, Charlie, very nice to hear your voice. We are doing great. Thank you very much. Great. And I was going to send you an email so I don't have to do it now to congratulate you on taking command, but it's awesome. It takes a little while, okay? It's not seven minutes. Yeah, it is a, a big honor for me and then uh, just happy to be able to work with a wonderful team on, on orbit as well as on the ground. I'm just happy to be part of the team. Well, we've got a, 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 an interesting group of young people down here who are just brimming to ask you all some questions. Uh, they're from all over the country. They're part of the Senate Youth Program. Uh, it's been going on for 52 years now and uh, I think this may be the first time this group has had an opportunity to do this. So. Can I get you and Rick to just talk to him a little bit about, about what's, what's going on right now before I let him ask questions? Yeah, we'll be happy to uh, uh, answer any questions. We want you to tell us what's going on right now. And uh, right now uh, we are uh, doing a lot of experiments on board the space station and preparing for the arrival of the uh, SpaceX-3. They'll be arriving on the 18th, and uh, our three crew members of Expedition 38 they left there a few days ago, and uh, they are safely on, on board. So just three of us are here, uh, Rick, me, and also uh, uh, Mikhail Turin, uh, our Russian crew member. So uh, it's kind of a little quiet now with three of us. Usually we have six crew, crew members on board, but we are uh, continuing to work on experiments and the maintenance and the systems operation. Fantastic. Rick, what's, uh, what are we looking at in the background? Looks like you're packing up stuff to come home, or is that stuff you've got to unpack? Yeah, that's a good eye, Charlie. Actually, that's uh, SpaceX. Uh, those are bags that will be returned on SpaceX. Like uh, Koichi said, if SpaceX arrives next week. Koichi will grapple it. We'll uh, berth it to the uh, node, too. And those bags back there with the green labels, once we empty SpaceX of all the science and experiments and uh, some bonus food, maybe, we'll put all the good uh, material that has to go back to Earth, samples and uh, uh, equipment that needs to be turned around again. Well, great. I'm going to let the young people take over now. So I'll ask them to introduce themselves and then go with their questions to you. 
Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for speaking to us today. My name is Ying Xin Guo, and I'm a delegate from Connecticut. Uh, my question to you is, what event in aeronautical history do you believe has been most influential to NASA and to the future of space exploration in the United States? Well, first of all, let me say uh, I'm from Connecticut also. That's a great, uh, it's a great place to grow up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, see, the, the biggest event, that's hard to choose, you know, uh, there's several big ones that, you know, over the history of, uh, of aeronautics, of course, um, you know, President Kennedy's speech about going to the moon, that's definitely one of them. Uh, the first landing on the moon is, is, is also another big one. And then I think uh, also you have to include the, uh, the completion of the assembly of the International Space Station. If you think about the space station, it's a, it's a million pounds of hardware designed, by, designed and developed in dozens of countries around the world and then assembled in space. And that is an incredible feat. And uh, I think uh, we can really build on that and go places from here. Next question. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Mumby. I'm the delegate from Connecticut. And I was wondering, um, NASA has conducted a research about the medical issues, about staying in space for a period of time. And there was a study done about squashed eyes, which was quoted from the Daily Tech article. And I was wondering, what has the NASA administration has done to subsidize, if not, if not ratify this problem? Yeah. yeah, that's a very uh, a good question. Uh, we have uh, uh, seen cases, uh, the uh, uh, vision uh, influence, actually degradation of vision uh, in uh, microgravity environment, spending many uh, hours, many days on board the space station. So actually, I'm one of the test subjects to, to participate in the study. Actually, we have an ultrasound uh, machine and uh, other equipment to precisely uh, measure the uh, formation or changes of our eye condition. And we have been gathering uh, this information. And uh, so with this data, hopefully we will be able to come up with the uh, countermeasures or even you know, change the diet or some, some other measures to, to cope with the situation. So we are still in the study, but we are making a progress in that field. Hello, um, my name is Tammy Vu Pham, and I am a delegate from the state of Georgia. Administrator Charles Bolden, among others, has called the International Space Station a space United Nations, and that countries from all over, and astronauts uh, from all over the world, um, can convene in one location and uh, build camaraderie. Um, how do you see the International Space Station as a a United Nations in building these multi-country partnerships? And how might this spur um, non-space um, countries into creating their own space programs? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, the, the space station has been, was built by over a dozen countries. And of course, we have folks uh, living and working up here from all around the world. We got Koichi from Japan, we got Mikhail from Russia, and me from the United States right now. Uh, of course, we have Canadian and European astronauts also at any given time. So, and we work as a crew. You know, I don't see Koichi as a Japanese astronaut. I don't see uh, Mikhail as a Russian cosmonaut. I see them as my crewmates. I, I don't recognize them coming from different countries. They're my crewmates. So, we're all equals up here. We all work together very well no matter what's going on on the planet if our countries are getting along or not getting along we still have great camaraderie up here and we work together very very well I think that's a great example for anything you know we just finished uh, the Olympics uh, back in Sochi uh, Russia another great example of countries getting together and working together and creating great things so I think these kind of examples are good and the more uh, the more times that uh, countries can get together and build things instead of destroying things I, I think that's a good example uh, for, for for anyone Next one. Come on up. Hi, I'm Matthew Callahan from Hawaii. And kind of going off the last question, uh, do you see any Chinese astronauts joining the International Space Station mission in the foreseeable future? And should America and other countries uh, make greater efforts to create cooperation between China and other space countries? Uh, 
Yeah, I think uh, the more the merrier for me. Uh, you know, <laughs> when the space station program has started, uh, we only uh, we did not have the Russian uh, participation, and then uh, in 1996 uh, we have uh, the Russian uh, participation in this uh, program, and then uh, since then uh, we have been working really close to, to each other, close with each other. So not only China, but I, I would like to see more and more countries uh, cooperate uh, in this uh, human space exploration. Hello, my name is Mary Margaret Cook, and I'm a delegate from Illinois. And my question is, um, I'm the daughter of a STEM educator, and I was just wondering how we can ensure that science, technology, engineering, and math education remains a priority despite the um, budget constrictions that agencies has, have faced in recent years. Yeah, that's uh, another good question. Um, obviously, a big part of NASA, a big part of our job working at NASA is to encourage and motivate students uh, any, from kindergarten all the way through high school and college and beyond to uh, study math, science, technology. And that's a big part of NASA, and we find that uh, very rewarding. I know I do. When I go out and talk to the schools, and I encourage kids, and I think if we just show them the things that we do, show them uh, what we see and what we do up here in space, what NASA has accomplished over the years, I think that's a great motivation for kids to go into the sciences and go into technology and engineering and things like that. So I think the way to really uh, ensure it is to is for NASA and other agencies, not just NASA, but is to, uh, to keep doing what we're doing, keep being successful, keep pushing the envelope, and keep encouraging students to join us and help us move forward. Hello, my name is Ishan Kumar from Indiana. Um, thank you for speaking with us. I have two questions. Um, how do you guys pass or spend time on the spacecraft? Uh, spacecraft? And um, can you also do a flip for us, possibly? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll let, uh, I'll let Commander Wakata demonstrate the flip <laughs> while I talk about our free time. <laughs> you know, a lot of our free time is spent looking out the windows, doing Earth observations. We love taking photographs of, uh, of different places. We love trying. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like hunting. You know, we want to take a picture of a, uh, you know, our hometown, for example, and you've know, got to check the orbital trajectory. You've got to make sure the lighting is just right. You've got to be in the right place at the right time. And then you've got to find these places out the window, which is not always easy when they're you know, looking at the world without all these lines that we're used to seeing on maps is a little more difficult. So uh, we spend a lot of time doing Earth ops, of course. Hi, I'm Betty Thomas from Kansas. And I went to an elementary school named after Kristen McAuliffe. So we always did a lot to honor her. And I was wondering how you guys are still like capturing the um, innate curiosity of all the students here on Earth. Uh, that's a very good question. As uh, Rick said, I think uh, we have to demonstrate, we have to show the excitement of what we are doing in space. This is the uh, human frontier for everybody on the planet. And it's really exciting to work and live and uh, do a, a lot of uh, different experiments and observation. Uh, Rick and Mike did spacewalks. Those are the very exciting activities. And uh, we need to just show how exciting those things are to the, to the children uh, so that they will be motivated and they will get interested in the science and technology. So we just need to keep pushing our envelope and then show, us, show uh, people uh, the wonderful thing that we do in space. Thank you. Hello, my name is Asya Akcha and I'm from Kentucky. And I was wondering if you could explain how you maintain your health and nutrition while in space, what sort of meals you eat, and how often you eat your meals. Yeah, actually, it's uh, for me, it was a little bit difficult when I first got up here maintaining my weight. It's very important for us to maintain our weight so we don't lose so much muscle mass and also bone density. Uh, so we have a wide variety of foods. And of course, uh, dietitians and doctors have worked uh, for years to try to perfect it for us. And so we basically can choose anything we want that's up here and eat it pretty much any time we want. Uh, I found that if I eat almost continuously, I can maintain my weight. Uh, so it's kind of nice because uh, I have to eat a lot in order to maintain 
my weight, which is kind of the opposite problem that I have back on Earth. Uh, and then, of course, we have lots of exercise equipment. We have an exercise bicycle. We have a treadmill where we have to wear a harness and bungees to pull us down to the treadmill. And we have a, a great uh, resistive exercise device. I'll call it weightlifting, but it uses a uh, evacuated cylinder to provide resistance. And we could do squats and deadlifts and bench press and uh, basically a whole series of 10 or 12 different exercises. And uh, we do those about two hours a day of exercise. So it's, uh, it's actually uh, quite difficult. You know, it's a hard workout up here. Thank you so much. Hello, gentlemen. My name is Nathan Lilly, and I'm one of the two delegates from Louisiana. And my question to you two is, what do you believe is the future of space travel for the general public? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think uh, I would like to see more and more people uh, going to space, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, commercial companies building the spacecraft. I think uh, that's a really good trend uh, to, to have this uh, uh, future of uh, space travel. I think uh, we are really close to have more and more people, uh, uh, general public, to go to space. Uh, first, uh, starting with the uh, suborbital flight, and then eventually on the orbital flight. So uh, I think we are in this uh, decade of uh, uh, going into space with more and more people involved. Thank you. Uh, hello, gentlemen. My name is John Kyle, and I'm the delegate from Mississippi. Uh, my question is for both of you. Um, what prompted your love of space? Yeah, that's uh, for me. It was I, I kind of realized in sixth grade, seventh grade, somewhere around there that that time that uh, I was very interested in science, very interested in uh, space, very interested in airplanes, things that anything that had wings and that could fly or a rocket behind it, pushing it into, into orbit was interesting to me for some reason. And I just pursued that throughout high school and then into college. I got an engineering degree. And then after that, I applied to NASA. And it took me a long, many, many years, more than nine years. But eventually, I got selected as an astronaut. OK, uh, I think uh, for me, it was the uh, Polo Luna ma landing when I was five years old. Uh, as a Japanese small boy, I thought that going to, into space was beyond my reach. Actually, there was no Japanese astronaut at that time. But uh, with the, uh, the international cooperation in space exploration, now here I'm working with Rick in the same place. And so uh, I think this international cooperation is the future to, to expand the, the, the way to the uh, people all over the world to, to go to space. And I, I really appreciate this. We'll try to get in two more. Good morning. My name is Daniel Carter from the state of Missouri. And I was wondering what your favorite experiment is on the International Space Station. Actually, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, exciting experiments. And then one of the examples is uh, really hands-on type training. Uh, one of the examples is the SPHERES experiment. Uh, we uh, test the uh, software developed by the scientists and engineers. Uh, that is a multi-satellite control and a robotics control type uh, experiment. So we can really see the, uh, the motion in the activity of that satellite. Uh, so uh, those hands-on type experiments are really uh, exciting. Next one. Is this going to be it today? Good morning. My name is Tyler Tepke Floyd, and I am from North Dakota. My question for you is, how does working with other nations affect your productivity and the overall success of the space program? Well, I think uh, working with all the all these other nations, including Japan and Russia, the European Europeans and the Canadians, uh, obviously, everybody brings something to the table. Everybody brings something to the space station program, all these different countries, as well as the uh, different astronauts, as well as the engineers and technicians. So I think it, I think everybody uh, 
uh, benefits from this. You know, not just if the United States just worked alone, we wouldn't be as successful as if we didn't have all these other countries uh, working with us. So I think everybody benefits from the, these, this, this cooperation. Uh, and, and like Koichi said, I think it's the great thing. You know, space travel is very, very expensive. Uh, doing these things that we do are very expensive. In one country, it's hard for one country to foot the whole bill. So I think cooperation with all countries around the world, we bring all these different talents together and everybody contributes and we can do some great things. Hey, Rick and Koichi, uh, they're telling me that our time is out. So uh, I want to thank both of you for the incredible job you did. Thanks for letting us come into your home. Uh, congratulations again, uh, Wakara-san, and you all continue to enjoy yourself. We'll try to get uh, the dragon up there for you Sunday or Monday, uh, and then uh, three more crew members at the end of the month. So thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. Some great questions. We appreciate it. And Houston, Station, uh, this is Houston ACR. Great. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, U.S. Senate Youth Group and Mr. Bolden. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank, thanks very much, Houston. You guys take care. Okay, we, we do have some time left. I know I promised you that we would, I didn't, we'll let you, you say five minutes? Okay, all right. Uh, any, anybody have questions that you did not get that you wanted to ask them or go ahead, just hop back up to the mic over there, anybody, and we'll try to get them uh, in the time we have left. I know Michelle is here if you've got other questions for her. And like she said, she'll be around for a little while. Hi, my name is Pavel Hockey. I'm a delegate from Iowa. Thank you very much for allowing us to come here today and learn so much about the progress that's going on. Um, a lot of us around here are interested in going into politics, political science, public policy. Um, and I know that uh, during the introduction of Michelle, uh, they mentioned that she had gone into public outreach for mm -hmm. science. And I was wondering how can we um, uh, who want to pursue an interest in that kind of public service, how can we be involved in science in particular? I think, you, you know, I'll let Michelle give you her take. Um, all of us are involved in, in helping uh, the, the leaders of the nation develop policy. You know, we give them our opinion about where, what space policy, policy should be. That's one of my jobs is to advise on that. But all of us are passionate about reaching young people. So we spend time in schools. We spend time in doing fora like this, uh, anything that we can. And I would say no matter what you do, whether you end up in politics or whatever else, don't fail to give some time to go, one, back home, uh, where you came from, to help them understand you, know, you were there. And if you did it, they can do it. So that's one of the things I think we try to do. I'll let Michelle add. Oh, yeah, if I could add a little bit to that. Um, so, you know, people are talking about you know, what influenced you to become a scientist. For me, it was Carl Sagan. He came out with his television show, Cosmos, when I was 10. And have any of you guys seen the Neil deGrasse Tyson version? Yes, I, it's really wonderful. I, I, I highly recommend it. To me, um, <clears throat> I love being a scientist because of the people that I work with. We're, we're creative, we're silly, we don't take ourselves too seriously. But one thing we do take very seriously is that this is your space program. You know, this is paid for by the taxpayers of the United States and international collaborations. And if we don't communicate back what our discoveries are, what our passions are, how inspiring this is, then we have not done that job. We haven't done our job. And one of the things I love about NASA is that NASA takes that very seriously. We have to bring along every person on the world we can on this journey. It is better for people to know the stuff we're learning. It makes us richer human beings. Good morning. My name is Rachel Sobrowski, and I am the delegate from Utah. And 35 years after the flag, U.S. flag was posted on the moon, 80% um, of students in the science and engineering fields listed as the lunar landing as one of their main inspirations for going into the field. And I was wondering, um, in the course of your career, what do you believe a, a single event or a series of events that you believe will be most inspirational in causing students to go into those same fields? Curiosity landing on Mars is one that uh, in, we had uh, Times Square packed because uh, Siemens worked with us. We had, you know, if you've been to New York City Times Square, you know the big screen in Times Square. Uh, Curiosity Landing was there, and, and the enthusiasm of the, of the, the people is, as Michelle said, we're human beings. We have, we have emotions and stuff, and if you had seen the members of the team, I mean, hugging and crying and doing everything else when Curiosity landed, that sort of uh, this generation's moon landing, to be quite honest, I, I think. Yeah, 
Yes, it's not every day you get to scream and cry at work. I mean, I remember 1.30 in the morning, local time, I was jumping up and down, screaming with tears coming down. Not every job has that, actually. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nimin Mann, and I'm from the state of Tennessee. My question was, with privatization of space on the rise, how do you both believe that um, everyday Americans would respond to life on a space station? Uh, I think they would find that they adapt. Uh, the human body is absolutely amazing. Once people get over what they perceive as their fear of going into space, uh, it's not like here on Earth in, in one respect. Uh, their gravity is overcome. But other than that, um, you know, the environment inside the station is like this room. Uh, the food we eat is essentially like the food you eat. Uh, as Rick and Koichi explained it, uh, you know, you, you use a fork, knife, spoon. Uh, you drink through a straw because liquids don't want to behave. But uh, even that's been overcome. Don Pettit, who was one of the astronauts that spent a couple of times on station, invented a, uh, a gra zero gravity coffee cup. Okay. You all have been absolutely incredible. Thanks very much to you, Michelle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with one thing because, you know, uh, you are here, and I want you to understand the impact that you can have. And, and I'll tell you a real quick story. And the story is about a young man by the name of uh, uh, um, Nikosi Johnson. Uh, Nikosi grew up in a small village in South Africa, and some of you have heard me tell this story before. It's my favorite story. Brandon, I think I talked when I was at Boys, at, at Boys State. Um, Nikosi was born with AIDS, uh, a small village called KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. His mother found a young white woman, Gail Johnson, and asked her if she would take her son after she died. She knew she was going to die after he was born. And, so, and sure enough, a few months after he was born, his mother died, and Gail took him. And, Everybody who knew Nikosi said, you know, he is not like anybody else we've ever met. This kid is always uh, worrying about other people, always worrying about his village, really battling against this incredible disease, and he believes he can make a difference. And as Nikosi grew up, he and Gail traveled all around South Africa, then all around the African continent, and then all around the world, crusading against AIDS. Uh, an American writer by the name of Jim Wooten had a chance to meet Nikosi, and he ended up writing a small biography of Nikosi Johnson called We're All the Same. He came back to the States, and he was called and said, hey, Nikosi's going to die. Uh, and he's not got very much long to live, and you better come back if you want to see him one more time. So Jim Wooten flew back to South Africa, went to the hospital, and he sat by Nikosi's bedside. And he said Nikosi was still barking out orders to people. You've got to do this. We've got to do that. Twelve years old, weighed less than 20 pounds. Uh, sores and pus and everything all over his face. Uh, Jim said these beautiful white teeth shining through this little black face all frail. And Nikosi is telling everybody what to do. And Jim said, stop. Just stop. He said, Nikosi, you're going to die. And he said, Nikosi looked up at him and he smiled and he said, yep. He said, you could die today. And Nikosi said, yep. He said, well, I don't get it. Why do you do what you do? You're, you know, you're a 12-year-old kid. Uh, as far as I know, you have never cried out in pain. You've never asked for any help. All you've ever tried to do is do stuff for other people. Why, why do you do that? And he said, Nikosi kind of looked up at him and he smiled. And he said, you know, you do all you can with what you have in the time that you have in the place that you are. Do all that you can with what you have in the time that you have in the place that you are. Take advantage of this opportunity. You all have met an incredible number of people. Uh, not a lot of people get to meet the President of the United States person to person like you're going to do this afternoon. Take what you learn back home and make a difference. You know, do all that you can with what you've been given in the time that you have on this earth, wherever you happen to be. So God bless all of you. Thank you so very much for sharing your time with us, and we hope you've enjoyed being with us. Thank you. Good morning, fellow, de fellow delegates, United States Senate Youth Program staff, and distinguished guests. My name is Tanner Schlegel, and I am the other delegate from the fine state of South Carolina. I'd like to start off by, thanking, by taking the time to thank Charles Bolden and the entire team at NASA for taking the time to talk to us. On an obligatorily cheesy note, we are often told, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Today, we have quite literally met someone who has answered this charge four times, Administrator Bolden shot for the moon and, in my opinion, experienced the greatness of the stars along the way. From his graduation from the United States Naval Academy and the other USC in California, to his military rankings in the Marine Corps 
in his jobs at NASA to his desire to advance the scientific and intellectual needs of the administration despite the challenges of a tightening fiscal belt, Administrator Bolden exemplifies the qualities that are at the core of the United States Senate Youth Program, education, leadership, and public service. In addition to representing the ideals of the program, Administrator Bolden makes me proud to call myself a South Carolinian because of his, because of his humble personality and his ability to do what he believes in. With his advice to be optimistic, compassionate in all that we do, and to not be afraid to ask, Administrator Bolden acts as a role model for all of us who desire to go on a course into uncharted territory. Again, I would like to extend a great and sincere thank you from the United States 52nd Annual United States Senate Youth Program Delegation to the entire team at NASA and Administrator Charlie Bolden. Tanner, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you guys for being a, a great audience. We wish you could spend the whole day with us. There's so much more than NASA story to share. We hope you'll follow us, as the poster says, on nasa.gov and on Facebook, on Twitter. Check out Michelle. Check out uh, the administrator. So much more that we want to share with you. But uh, our, our time has come to an end here. And I do want to say a big thank you to Bob Jacobs and our Office of Communications. They do an amazing job for us. I want to thank my executive officer, uh, John Gain, and I want to thank everybody associated with the uh, U.S. Senate Youth Program, uh, the amazing director, Rainey Guilford. Thank you for, uh, for bringing you these uh, great young people to see us here, and thanks, of course, to the Hearst Foundations for all that they do to support you guys. And uh, best wishes. Hope to see some of you back here in the NASA family someday.